Hi everyone, thanks for joining and tuning in for our athletes and activism panel. I'm Javi Lopez, SBU Academy student athlete and also the host of Sabro's Talks with Javi. Hi everyone, I'm Meredith Casales and some of you may remember me as the host from last year's event and I know I look a little different on screen. And hi, um, I'm Sanusi Sise, also a senior in the SBU Academy. Tonight, we're speaking with three esteemed guests who will be sharing their experiences as professional athletes and as activists standing up for causes they believe in. First, I would like to welcome Vin Baker. Vin currently is an assistant coach for the Milwaukee Bucks, one of the six NBA teams he played for. He is a four-time NBA All-Star, 2011 gold medalist, University of Hartford, all-time leading scorer, published author and founder of the Bouncy Back Foundation. Welcome, Vin. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Next, we have Imani Dorsey, a forward with Sky Blue FC. Imani was named the National Women's Soccer League 2018 Rookie of the Year. She's an ambassador for Athlete Ally, where she uses her platform to advocate for the equal inclusion of LGBTQ plus individuals in sport. She has also been active in Sky Blue FC's Go Vote initiative. Welcome, Imani. Thanks for having me, you guys. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Josie Morrow. Justin is a defender for Toronto FC who has also been capped by the U.S. national team. This year, he took an entirely different role as the executive director of Black Players for Change, a collusion consisting of over 170 players, coaches, and staff in the MLS, working to bridge the racial equality gap that exists in society. The organization formed shortly after the killing of George Floyd. Welcome, Justin, and thank you all so much for being here. I know you can see them, but there's like 100 people out there in the audience. Now let's start with the questions. Thank you so much. I would like to talk about some specific initiatives that you, Justin, have been involved in. If you don't mind, if we could start with you. Um, can you share more with us about how what the idea of the Black Player for Change came from and how the collision got started in the MLS? Yeah, so like, like everyone, we were sitting at home this year um, during the pandemic. Everyone has all these crazy uh, emotions built up because we're super stressed about what's going on in the world, not knowing what's going to happen next, um, spending months and months on end in our houses. And then we start negotiating this return to play with the league um, that wasn't going so well, was a little bit rocky. So there's even more emotion on top of that original emotion built up. And then uh, you add on the death of George Floyd. And it was really in that moment when the black players were leaving together and we decided that we needed something for ourselves. And so it was just a really emotional moment. We got on a call. I think there was a little bit over 70 of us and we just bonded with each other and our blackness in that moment and shared our emotions and decided that we needed an organization that was gonna fight for ourselves within the league, but also fight for the broader community. And that's really where this idea came from and where we were born. Um, since then, it's been an absolutely roller coaster ride. Um, from doing demonstrations when we did our return to play to um, building t-shirts for awareness to all the things that we've done on social media to town halls lots of the education pieces and and working with the league to to change their structure and what they can do on racial equality and diversity issues so we've had our hands in a lot of different things we're moving very fast but it's been really fulfilling to to be a part of a, a brotherhood and sisterhood of everyone connected doing these things together. The very coolest thing about all of this is just being connected with people like Imani, people like Ben, um, all different sports connected working together. I can't tell you how many different calls I've been on with different professional athletes that I've never spoken to before, but realized that we're all fighting the same thing and, and now we're starting to do it together. Um, one of the very cool things um, I could say to Ben is that when Milwaukee uh, decided not to play, I think it was August 26th in, in the bubble, that set off a chain reaction and, and MLS had, I think it was seven games that night and we decided to play, we decided not to play in, in solidarity with them and, and that was a chain reaction throughout all the sports and so you can, you can see how we've come together like we never have before um, and it's a really powerful movement, it's the most powerful thing that I've ever been a part of. 
um, we're not going to let the momentum die. We're going to make sure this conversation is carried on and, and Black Players for Change is built to end systemic racism within our league. So first and foremost, we're going to push against that and, and make sure that our sport and our league is, is promoting racial equality and accessibility, which we know it doesn't do right now. And then at the same time, support everyone else in this fight as well, because we know that it's going to take all of us to do it together. So it's been, it's been really cool to be a part of, uh, really heavily, heavy emotionally, but uh, feel the, the large support from my peers of professional athletes around me. Imani, um, I think the NWSL was actually the first major sports league to come back both during the pandemic and after the death of George Floyd. Um, how did it feel for you and your teammates to be back on the field after all that? Yeah, well, I mean, that was pandemic, like <laughs> this pandemic has been the oddest thing, especially in terms of competing and being a professional and having to balance the requirements of what's expected of you to perform on top of just the chaos that is 2020 right now. Um, so, I mean, it was very, it was initially pretty nerve wracking, I think, to um, get behind the concept just because it was a bit drawing coming from quarantine straight into training and then a tournament in um, Utah in July. But I think once we got there and once we were able to train together as a team, it was really, it was awesome to be together and be able to um, feel like we were giving people a sense of normalcy. And then on top of that, being the first league back it, we knew that we had um, a moment to step into in terms of um, what was happening in our country at the time and I mean especially for the black players who were on my team um, going to training was it just ex another part of just it being um, mentally tired from what was happening um, and I we knew that we had we wanted to make a statement and we had an opportunity to make a statement. So, I mean, the way that initially um, sort of um, the protests of the kneeling during the national anthems and kind of the coverage that that got um, was very important because I think it set the tone for the rest of the leagues coming back, the tone for viewers that this was going to be normal in a standard and it, like not expected but this is going activism is going to be a part of sport and there's usually a lot of um controversy or pushback from that in some ways people want sport to be separate from um what players are doing off the field they want their off the field personas to be separate from the sport that they watch so they can enjoy it for what it is and not have to worry about the world that's happening around them. But I think it was a really important moment for us to be like, this is happening and this is affecting us as players. And we're going to, this is what we want to talk about and what we want to share. Um, and we're going to put this in the limelight and make sure that everybody knows that this is going to be the conversation moving forward. I appreciate that. I wanted to also add on, um, in SVU, um, all of our teams, we, we have seasons every every spring and fall and a lot of our teams face a lot and we still do a lot of discrimination and a lot of prejudice against us when we get there and it's very mm -hmm. uncomfortable but it's gotten to the point where all of us are kind of used to it and that's what's sad about it mm -hmm. but um myself and Javi we're the captains of our teams and I believe Sinusi as well and we just um we had we did this thing where at every game we kneel down at the beginning and it started off because of everything that was going on in social media and we were just tired of all this prejudice before a game when it's like a game that we we're supposed to love you know mm -hmm. so like we did this thing where before every game we email the coaches just to let them know ahead of time that we're gonna do it and if they would like to do it with us or not that's on them but we knew that we were gonna do it and that's something we want to continue throughout the season and explain to other teams why we're doing it and why it's such a big issue because soccer can be mixed with you know what's going on in our society now so mm -hmm. yeah that's awesome and I mean conversation I felt like was the biggest thing that I've taken away from this summer because 
we had to have conversations as a team about what was going on. And for the first time, I'm hearing some of my teammates who didn't really understand what was happening or why there was controversy around kneeling during the national anthem, controversy around kneeling during the national anthem. And I mean, I think it brought a lot of um, my white counterparts to come to terms with these issues that black people are facing every day and like have to make a decision on how they are going to be an ally and what they need to do to learn and grow from that. So that's really awesome that you guys are doing that. Uh, before I go to the next question, I, I would like to talk about um, the topic too. Um, about like um how we um have to we um, have to kneel down before um every game and I would like to shout out Ravi I mean Javi for starting that because like um like as people as many people know like I was um a part of somebody like um 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 saying what she swear towards me so like that the fact that like he did that and like for everybody to like know that like um he's not right shows like a difference like in like the community and like how like as like a youth, we can change. We 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 have the voice to change anything. So um, going um to vent um, the Milwaukee book like really made like history when you guys worked out the NBA game in August following the shooting of Jacob Blake. Can you tell us like more about um the team decision like and how did you all manage to come to the consensus, and what were you thinking at the time of how it will affect the wider world of sport? Um, so I think for us, you know, obviously like it hit the, the rest of the world. Um, what happened to Jake, Jacob Blake was a, a tragedy. Um, and we certainly thought it was an egregious act and, you know, we, we felt as a team, you know, just being in the bubble and it was, it was really players and coaching staff, um, and it hit home for us literally and figuratively. Um, it was kind of in our backyard. And it really started with a few players that really, you know, um, watched it and we, we met and we talked about it. And we came up with the thought and idea that there was no better time like that time to make a statement. Usually when you have to make a statement of that magnitude, to for something that that happened that big for the world to see there's really no great time or perfect timing for it um and it was bigger than sport for us and you know we met as a team we talked as a team prior it was it was game five of the playoffs uh a closeout game actually against the orlando magic and again the passion and the compassion was so high for the blake family and for cer certainly for everything that's been happening in our country and in the world really for 2020 and it, it just kind of hit ahead for us and the, we really couldn't think about the game really couldn't think about basketball it was really thinking about the Blake family thinking about all the things the social injustices that have happened all during the year and we just wanted to use that opportunity to use our voices uh, we, we felt like we had at least the sporting world the eyes were the basketball sporting world that is the eyes were on us and um we took that opportunity to um you know make a statement um that we were terribly disappointed at what happened in kenosha and that we wanted to see change and um i think you know we didn't we didn't come out victors we didn't come out champions uh with the nba finals but I know everyone that was in that locker room and everyone in our organization will have that um, with us for the rest of our lives. Uh, it was important. I think the guys would do it all over again. And we just hope, you know, we don't want that, that moment just to be a moment in history where we just uh, went out and, and we boycotted the game. We want, we want to see change. And so um, we banded together as brothers uh, as teammates and as coaching, as a coaching staff, and we made the decision not to play the game. And then, uh, fortunately for us, um, the rest of the league and the rest of the teams that were there in the bubble with us followed, and um, that's how it came about. But it all started from just passion and compassion, just you know having love for our fellow brother um, and wanting to show support and uh, use our voices and use the platform that we had 
to try to make a difference and try to make a change. Big respect. Imani, Salmon United is actually part of the global initiative called Playground to help LGBTQ you feel more safe on the soccer field. What motivated you to get involved in Athlete Ally and why do you feel it is so necessary to highlight this problem? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so my initial like passion for these issues is really um, from college. A lot of my college teammates um, are a part of the LGBTQ community and it was really the first time that I was in an environment where I felt like I needed to step up for my teammates. Um, and our culture at Duke was very much, you look after your, your sister and you, um, you support one another on and off the field. Like student athlete, the life of a student athlete can be very hectic and crazy and it's, you need each other to get through it. Um, and I just know that from my experience as a black woman in a predominantly white space at like women's soccer in this country, I knew that I always appreciate it when my white teammates and friends step up for me and speak up for me. Um, and so I, I know what it feels like to have somebody stand with you and be like, hey, this may not be affecting me directly, but I know that it's affecting them and it's not cool and this needs to change. Um, it shouldn't be the case, but that always brings legitimacy to movements. We see with the civil rights movement in the 1960s that for a large part, it was successful because white people decided to take part. And um, that's just the way of the things, like things work. Um, so I knew how important that was and how important it was, how much love I have for my teammates and how I want them to feel accepted and um, feel like that they belong in this world, in this in sport, because they do. Thank you. We also have some questions submitted from member of SB Youth Council and Activism Club. Did, you, did activism or social justice mean anything to you when you was growing up? Thank you, that's a great question. So growing up for me, um, activism has always been a part of who I feel like something that's been important to me and it's been important to my family. Um, I always um, recall back to my great aunt. She was the state's attorney in Baltimore City for about 15 years. Um, and that was a lot of my time growing up as a young kid. So I was around democracy a lot. Um, and those were just normal conversations that were had at my dinner table. Um, how like the black community can be involved in what I can do personally and what my family can do personally to help progress the cause of black people. My father was also, um, he's an alpha phi alpha who is also very involved in their community. I'm a member of black professional men. So I've always had mentors in my life and just my role models and my parents who have always been, um, always teaching me to try to do more for my community and what can I do to help others? Because I feel like um, being a black woman as I have, I face those challenges. I've also been given like a very blessed and privileged life. I've, um, my parents have sent me to great schools. I've had like great opportunities and I feel like any way that I can give back and do more has been um, super important to me. But I mean, moving forward, I think it's been learning what causes are most important to me and what I'm most passionate about and um, learning how to use my voice and what I want to say a lot of the times. And I think I've really come into that um, the last couple of years in my professional career um, and really understanding what it is that I'm really passionate about and want to get involved in. Um, Justin, do you, do you have, do you want to talk about it too? Yeah, thanks. So I grew up in, in Cleveland, Ohio from humble beginnings. You know, I was a middle class family and my father police officer for over 25 years in, in Cleveland police. My mother, a teacher, um, both religious. You know, I grew up going to church every every Sunday. And so that automatically instilled in me and uh, a spirit of, of giving and working for others. And then like Imani, I was afforded good opportunities. They sent me to a really good high school um, on the other side of the city. So I would trek to the other side of the city, take the bus to get there. 
and it was a, a prep school, a Catholic prep school, and, um, and it was started by the Jesuits. It's called Cleveland St. Ignatius, and the whole the whole spirit around that school and the whole um, theory is being a man for others because it's an all boys school, and that's really where my my spirit of working for others and giving as much as myself really came and and this idea of activism really came from they really they made it really easy to to be going out and and doing things after school uh, made it really accessible for us and let us know that it it doesn't have to be this burden that you have to help other people that it should come in in every day in every part of your life whether it was um you know shoveling driveways for for older people in the community who couldn't do it um delivering food for for those older people who couldn't get out of their homes and and get their own food um sometimes we'd go around on on saturday nights and uh feed the homeless around cleveland that was that was one of the bigger projects but they offered all of these different types of things to us and made it really easy for us to do it and I think that's where it just really grew a passion inside of me that I was able to carry through college and now into the professional ranks. There's so much personal stuff along the way, but I think those are the little things that you don't, you don't really forget. And it takes a good opportunity to experience something like that, where it really builds inside of you and, and sticks with you the rest of your life. So for me, that's, that's really where my spirit of activism came from. So I'll, I'll add also, I, I grew up in the church as well. Um, my father was a minister basically from day one for me and now a pastor and I'm now a minister. So it's kind of the family business. And so growing up in the church, understanding and, and pretty much being in a, a community where not as many uh, black folk were there, brown and black, brown, brown and black folk were there. Um, and then growing up in a Baptist church, um, I really became super diverse in my communication with different people and understanding different people. I think when you, <clears throat> one of the things I learned from kindergarten is um, growing up in such a, in, in that type of community, you learn to have compassion and compassion and compassion for different people, um, even though they don't look like you or sound like you. Um, you have compassion and, and, and it comes from the spirit taught in church about being taught in church about the spirit and um, just loving people and, and, and trying to uh, be the best possible person I could be, be the ve best version of me um, when, I, when I come in contact or interact with anyone uh, on any level. And certainly um, sports, um, is such a diverse community and, and, and it brings you together and teaches you camaraderie and teaches you togetherness. And so for me, just learning in the church and, and certainly learning from sports um, is what gave me my spirit of activism and, and you know, carried it, carried it to now as an adult. Was there a moment for all of you when you realized you wanted to make a change in the world? Right. I, I'll, I'll start, I think for me, um, I just always wanted to, you know, as I mentioned, being the son of a minister, uh, being the son of a pastor and, and growing up in the spiritual environment, you always try to figure out what you can do um, to help the world be better uh, in so many different levels. Uh, it started just me singing in the choir, um, being an usher, being a junior deacon, um, and then I got blessed to have this extraordinary height and extraordinary talent. And so for me, it was like, what can I do? Not just with, with the things that I learned growing up in church and growing up in my hometown, but now I have this ability and this talent, this talent. Um, I, I've got to have some impact on, on the world and um, not necessarily the entire world, but my world, what can I do to, to be better in my own world? So, I think from a little kid, from the time I was five, six, seven years old, I always wanted to be special. But you know, when you're young, it's all about you. Uh, then at some point it just became about what can I do to use my story, my talent, my ability um, to help other people. And um, that's what I've morphed into now at the age of 48. It starts off, you know, you wanna be something special for yourself 
um, like any other kid wants to be. But soon, I think the biggest thing, I think when life changed for me is how can I use what God has given me to help other people? Um, when you become selfless, I think that's when you really start living. For me, I, I've kind of always had a little bit of, of it, and I and I spoke to a little bit about that in high school and how that instilled and, and grew in me. But I think the tipping point of what's pushed me to this new level is is having children and the birth of my daughters. Uh, I have two two young biracial daughters. My oldest is five now. My youngest is two. And as things are happening in this world even before they were born, I, I dealt with them in a different way than I do now, especially because I, I consider myself um, aptly able to, to handle these things that have happened. I've had all these experience happen to me. Um, I've had a lot of positive experience that have given me strength and allowed me to get to where I am today. So I always felt like I had the tools to navigate all these different situations and that uh, no matter what was happening in society, I always thought, you know what, I'll be okay. I'll, I'll, I'll make it for myself. I'm not, I'm not too worried. And then these two beautiful young girls come into my life and, and you have to take care of them. And you realize that I have more within me to, to help change the world for, for them to make their future better because I don't want them to deal with the stuff that I dealt with. Maybe they won't be as strong as I was. Um, and they shouldn't have to deal with it anyways. And so you step up to the plate, you start doing more. And, and kind of like Ben was say, saying, you can you start being selfless and, and that's thinking of the people around you. Um, it took the birth of my daughters for me to, to start doing that. But like I said, I have the ability to step up and use my platform and, and do more. And so I, I felt that burden, that responsibility when they were born and they've been my guiding light since then. Thank you so much. Um, to follow up on that, when did you all realize that you could be more than a professional athlete and that you could have a positive social impact as well? Ben, if you want, or Iman, or Justin, you can start it off. Yeah, I'll, I'll go, I, I guess. Um, I think for me, understanding the time when I understood that I could be more than a professional athlete, I know we talked. I talked about growing up in the church, but once you become a professional athlete, things, the dynamics changes, everything changes in life. Um, you know, as far as fame and fortune and things change for me. And for me, my, my story is well documented. For me, it took me to uh, hit a sort of rock bottom in my life from a, from a career standpoint and, and some personal things that were going on in my life. It took me to hit rock bottom uh, interestingly enough, to understand that when I was a professional athlete, I thought I, I could do everything, but it was it was back to that selfish thing. I had kind of gone from being selfless to selfish. But when I um, had the fall from grace um, and started to pick up the pieces, I started to understand that my story could really help a lot of people and I could really have some impact on people that could potentially, or people who probably have gone through some of the things that I've gone through. And I realized that I had a story, I had this storied basketball career, but now I have this story of this fall from grace. And so it was really, I think I was maybe 38, 39 years old, when it really hit me that I can have a great impact on other people by using my testimony, by using my story, and in some ways using my infamy um, with the things that happened to me to really change and have some impact and effect on other people's lives. Like why not use the, the, the media coverage? Why not use all the negative things that surrounded this fall to show people that we can, you know, we can get up from this. And so that's, that's when I really, I felt like I can have some impact on other people's lives. And then because I grew up in the church, I felt like it was all for this. Everything that I went through was all to help other people. And again, that's when I, when I figured out that this testimony and my story could have impact is when I really started to live. So it took me, it took me a while to get there, 
and it wasn't comfortable getting there, but um, I, I'm here now. And, and so I'm, I, I, I have to say it's no better time in my life because I feel like I'm impacting other people and not just impacting my own life. So for me, the biggest thing that I feel like I've realized becoming a professional is the visibility aspect of just being at um, this level. People are, there are going to be more eyes on you. There are going to be more people paying attention to what you're doing. And um, most importantly, there are going to be a lot of young people that are looking to you and looking at the level that you've reached and being like, I want to get to that point someday because that was me as well um, growing up. And I think it's been really important for me to be a voice for young black women in the sport of soccer, because a lot of times um, we are like a minority. I grew up in a predominantly white suburban area, and I was very used to being one of the only black people in my classroom or on the field. And um, there's definitely challenges that I have experienced because of that. And any way that I can, um, give some encouragement or experience um, to a player going through the same predicament is something that's really important to me. And I just, I remember growing up, it was always really empowering for me to see black women and black athletes succeeding. Michelle Obama is my hero for just the way that she handles herself and she's just incredible. And Serena Williams is another one that I am just in awe of both of the Venus sisters. Um, I looked up to so much growing up um, and just seeing other women and doing what you're doing. And I think that's, it's really cool for me to now be a part of that um, and give back in any way I can. Yeah. And, and for me, it took a little bit of time like been uh, to settle into my career a little bit. I wasn't one of these guys or one of these players that transitioned from college to professional very easily. I wasn't a high draft pick. I wasn't playing right away when I first started my professional career. It took me some time to get there and I, I was really focused in the beginning and, and really caught up in the game and how I was gonna survive and how I was gonna do well. I was just so single-mindedly set on that focus um, that I kind of pushed everything to the side. And it's, it wasn't until a couple years in when I knew that I was going to have a longer professional career that I thought, okay, now I have this time on my hands. What am I going to do with it? And, and I think a lot of guys and gals get caught up in what professional sports can bring to them, whether that's the money, that's the, the love, the fame. Um, I think that once people realize that, that's not as fulfilling as giving yourself. Um, that's, that's the moment that they'll come around and, and start using their time to, for others because a little bit of our time, like Imani was saying, a little bit of our time goes a long way because people really care what we're up to. And we know that the young boys and girls in our world really look up to us. And, and we as role models have to exemplify of, of the right way to do things. And so after like three or four years in the league, I, I started taking more time to to do after school programming and, and visit schools. I was in San Jose in, in the Bay Area and there's no shortage of schools in that area that, that need help. And so I would visit a little bit with them and, and understand more of their needs and what they needed in each community. And it wasn't, it wasn't like I felt like I was changing the world in that moment because I was only giving an hour of myself um, every couple of weeks or whatnot. But it goes a long way. People really appreciate it. And that just helped build and, and help grow this passion that I have for today. So for me, it took, it took a little, little while and it was just understanding the, the professional sports landscape, getting my feet underneath me and then rearranging my vision about what I could be as a professional athlete over the length of my longer career. And then I'll definitely, if I can add one more point from like the female perspective, and especially for my league, we're not getting, we don't get paid very much money. And that's just a fact of the matter for our sport at this point. So coming into it for me, it's like, I want to have a professional career. I want to do well. I don't know how long it's going to last. I don't know how long I'm going to be able um, to sustain this lifestyle. So it's always been in the back of my mind that there has to be another plan for me, like what comes after my sport. And I was an environmental science and policy major in school. And I want to always keep um, that type of background, like in the back of my head when I'm thinking about my professional career. 
Um, but I mean, I think my activism and my involvement has given me so much life experience and just in terms of understanding what is what are things outside of the sport that I'm passionate about and how can I use what I know from my sport um, to advance change and then that in turn will help me down the line in what in continue projects that I can do after I'm playing because every athlete knows that there comes a day where we can't play the sport anymore and it's like what do we do after that fact. So <clears throat> this question is for all of you. Um, anyone can start. But how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected your activism work, positively or negatively? But how, how has it affected? I can, I can start uh, probably with the, the most obvious thing is Zoom calls have <laughs> taken over our lives in 2020 in a positive way in that I can connect with people like I've never connected before all across the United States, all across North America, all across the world. I've had the privilege of, of being in Zoom rooms with, with incredible people that I'd never thought that I would be in rooms with, um, talking to, empathizing with, sharing emotions with, and that's all because of the pandemic. And, and although we're all living through a historical moment in our lives and in the history of the world, um, tons of negatives there. I think one of the positives is that we've been able to connect on a different level um, and, and realize that life can slow down and we can still get things accomplished and the world will, will keep turning. Um, so I've been able to, to gain a little perspective in that sense, but I've also been able to connect with some wonderful people like yourselves, and that's been a really big positive for me. Um, I can completely agree with Justin, just in terms of Zoom is all my whole day now, but in a good way, it's definitely, um, the pandemic, I think initially was definitely, I think, an opportunity for everybody to gain a sense of perspective and um, for me, it was really, we weren't training and we were kind of on our own schedule for like two months or something. And it became an opportunity for me to really reinvest in what I enjoy about my sport outside of the actual sport itself. So being a professional without like having to, when you're not on the soccer field. Um, and that was an opportunity for me to learn more, to learn more about my community, to learn more about my history. Um, and I think I'm really grateful for that because I don't do that enough. Um, and I think it was a, it became kind of a reignition of the passion that I have for certain issues. So. Yeah, I agree as well. It just has given me time to reflect and given me time to um, think uh, in spirit. Um, and with the Zoom calls, giving us time to really focus in on the issues that are at hand and really come up with a plan and really uh, talk with each other about these things that are happening in our country um, without scrambling with, with the sport or scrambling with other things that, that usually take up our time, practices, training, games, um, it really, you know, obviously COVID-19 has slowed that down and really given us time to really reflect. I know I've been able to um, teach and preach at my church on a conference call because we're not allowed to uh, go in the church. And my church is in Connecticut. So I've been able to get on the calls on Wednesday nights and teach and then get on the calls on Sundays and preach. And so it's really allowed me to connect spiritually and connect with people on the issues that we're, we're dealing with in our, in our country. And there's a lot of issues going on. So it's, it's, been a, it's been a blessing in disguise in some ways to be able to connect with people who share the same thoughts and, and, and at the end of the day can share the same prayers. How do you manage your time as a professional athlete or, or coach so that you can also be involved in positive work off the field or court? Um, I think it, you know, in, in some ways outside of the schedule of having games and having practice, it, it's 
it's our duty. It, it kind of comes with the territory. They kind of morph into each other um, just because you're around, if it's not fans, you're around young people all the time um, when you're not, again, when you're not in practices and games. And so it's really about if you're going to take that opportunity, given the platform that you have to say something, to, to support young people to to be active um and i think it's 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 a responsibility and it, i understand the schedule um but i think all the professional athletes on this panel will agree that from games to practice you're talking about probably in, in training you're talking about five hours of the day and so if you make a concerted effort and it means something to you, you do have the time to make a change and make a difference and support change and help other people. Uh, it's just a matter of, of if you're a professional athlete or a coach, do you want to turn that selfishness into selflessness? Because the time is there. It's just, are you willing to do it? And, and is it important enough to you to do it? Yeah, I'll follow up with what Vin said. It's for me, it's not hard to find the time. It's it's because it's something that I really care about. And I think each of us as professional athletes will will spend our time doing the things that we care about when we're not on the field. Um, that might be hobbies for other people that might be games for other people that might be continuing education. For me, I'm passionate about this space, so it's not when I have the time, I'm filling it with this, and there's there's nothing else distracting me from that. I have my sport, I have my family, and I have this, and and those are the things that I'm most passionate about, and that's what I spend my time with. So for me, it's it's not hard to find the time. Like Ben was saying, our our schedules are so defined that there's there's normally a cadence, and now 2020 has thrown a little. Um, a little screw in the machine and in, in that things have changed a little bit. Uh, but normally our cadence allows for predictability and to know when our time's coming up and when we can, we can fill it and, and make it useful for something else. And when I have that, I fill it with this. And so for me, it's, it's not that hard at all. Yeah, I would agree. I honestly feel like I was more busy in, in a different way in college, just a lot of schoolwork taking up a lot of your time and a lot of class. Um, so not having that, I have a lot more time to focus on things that I want to focus on when I'm not in training. And it's really like what you decide to put your time and effort into. I'm sure you have all learned a lot from others who came before you. Who is someone in sports that you admire? Vinny, if you want to start off with this one. Um, so I, I thought about this, obviously, Thanks for getting, getting us the questions. And I thought about this and um, one of the people I really admire in our sport is uh, our guy in Milwaukee, uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo. Um, I, I think the reason I admire him and I've been around him for going on four years now is that as, a, as extraordinary of an athlete as he is, uh, two-time MVP at 25 years old, I don't think I've ever been around an athlete that's been that successful and been that great at a sport who cared about people uh, as much as he does. Um, he genuinely cares for people, uh, takes the time to talk to people. You know, I've been, you know, um, we've gotten into cities at one in the morning, two in the morning and Literally, the, the, the young men will stop and talk to people and sign autographs and just genuinely has passion and compassion and care for people. And I, I've been around a lot of athletes. I've been in the NBA since I was, since 1993, now a coach. Um, and I just haven't seen that type of person uh, and, and with that level of success uh, care about people so much and you know really takes the time out to use his platform and use his talent to affect other people's lives and uh so he's he's 
he's got my vote. He's I, I've had Muhammad Ali in the past. I've had Michael Jordan in the past. I've had a lot of people. My dad. And so Giannis is, is taking on, on the um, the new, he's the new champion of that for me. Um, Justin, you want to add on our money? Yeah, uh, for me, she's not in my sport, but I mentioned Serena. Um, but another one is Maya Moore, the WNBA star, who is just, I, I remember when she, it came out that she was um, taking a year off to, help fight for Jonathan Irons, her now husband, which is, I love that as well. Um, But I mean, I've really admired the way the WNBA has been consistently for years now um, involved in social justice and they have always been doing this work. And um, Maya especially has been someone that I've really admired Yeah, for me, it's all of the athletes that have taken up such a big role that came before my generation. Um, So some of the some of the biggest names you've heard, like Ben said, Muhammad Ali, um, Bill Russell, Arthur Ashe, Jackie Robinson, because what they lived through was so much more difficult than what I lived through and what I had to go through for them to stand up and do the things that they did was unprecedented and really their lives were on the line that's not those consequences aren't something that i have to deal with you know i i us black players did a protest before the first game when we returned to play in in disney world in orlando uh where we're all in the field together raising our fists and there's no there's there's barely any blowback from that and and that's because they have paved the way for us. And I can't imagine the things that they had to go through, the feelings they must have had when they made their stands, they stepped off the court, they stepped off the field, they stepped off the ice and went back to their normal day lives, sitting at home, you know, just worrying about their lives. That, that had to be such a heavy burden that we don't have to deal with. And mostly it's because of what they did to get us here today. I was, I was born in the late 80s on the back end of some really, really heavy decades, right? And so I become a professional athlete not until 2010 was my first year. And so to live in this generation that I have so many wonderful things afforded to me, so many things that I don't even have to think about day in and day out that they dealt with so that I can get to where I am today. So for me, my hat's off to them and really, I aspire to to have such a heavy impact the way that they have. That was great. That was great. That was great. <laughs> um, what advice would um, you guys give to young people like us, like student athletes, and in general, like today's youth? I'll let the youth go first. I, I heard born in the late '80s, so I'm gonna. That just pretty much put me in my place. So <laughs> I'll let I'll let you guys go first, and then I'll I'll let the old guy bring it home. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so as you guys are doing, don't be afraid to carry on the conversation. I know you guys are doing it in your own ways that you explained before, following the footsteps of what we've done as you look up to us. That's so important because doing things like that opens up the door to have conversation because when you do that, guess what? People expose themselves and their true thoughts come out by the way they react, by the way they, they speak to you. And that opens up the door for a conversation that, hey, maybe you can relate to them something that they never thought of before, that they are able to change their mind. And slowly like that, we're, we're changing the world one by one. There's been lots of conversations happening in this space since we started. A lot of people have been, been talking about working from, from inwards outwards. And if you can embody the change that you want to see, that's going to go a long way for affecting your world and the future generation's world. So continue to do what you're doing on that, using your platform in any way possible, and make sure you're taking your education very seriously. For me, that was that was always a guiding light in my life. I knew I wanted to be a professional athlete. It was, my, it was always my main goal, uh, but education was not far behind. And I knew that if I was gonna do anything in life, if I was gonna be successful, 
that I needed to take my education really seriously, that I wanted to finish high school, that I wanted to graduate from college because if I did that, I would have all the tools that I would need in my arsenal to, to go into the world and make a positive impact, not only for myself, but in the world. And so if I'm telling you guys anything, make sure you're using your platform, continuing the conversation, don't be scared, don't be afraid to speak up in all the in all the rooms where you might be the only one and, and you feel outnumbered if you see if you see something if you hear something that's unjust to speak on it don't let a moment pass and continue to press on your education because that's going to propel you to the places that you want to go yeah i agree with everything justin said and i'm trying not to repeat what he said but your education is really important it's been something that i feel like was instilled in me from a young age it just opens doors and it creates opportunities and I mean you guys are clearly like very well-rounded smart young individuals so you will have doors open for you as long as you keep going on the path that you're going on and to that point I I just want to say continue like not necessarily not to worry about what the future holds but trust that follow what you're passionate about and by doing that doors will open and I mean, focusing on your education and continuing to step up in the ways that you are in your community, you will, you will have the world at your fingertips because you guys are some talented young kids and not kids, but <laughs> young adults. Um, and then the last thing I would say is don't underestimate the power that you can, the change you can create just in yourselves and in your group, in your circles. I mean, what you guys were talking about with your demonstrations and kneeling um, at the beginning of your games, that's important and that's impactful and that's gonna, that's gonna be in people's minds. Um, so never underestimate the change that you can have and what you can do, even if it's not restructuring the entire system, none of us can do that. But I mean, if we each do our little part, like we're gonna have a lot more change. So keep doing what you're doing. Appreciate that. So, so I'll add just kind of bringing up the rear here um, and, and dating myself again. I have a 21 year old son um, that attends University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And one of the things I'm constantly talking to him about, he has uh, aspirations to play in the NBA and, um, you know, play in the NBA. He, he really wants to, you know, follow in his dad's footsteps. But one of the conversations that I have often with him is about, you know, it goes back to the selflessness and selfishness, like making the cause. And I always tell him, you know, Ben Jr., like you've got to make the cause bigger than you. Like it, it can't be, I'd like to play in the NBA because I want to be famous or I want to be this and I want to be make money. Like if the cause is bigger than you, like what impact can you have if you make it to the NBA and your community, on your family? on your teammates, on staff, like, I'm of the belief that when you make the cause bigger than you, when you get to that point that you, you're you tired or you're exhausted, but you're thinking about other people, I think you'll push through. Like, if it's about somebody else, you'll fight harder, you'll you'll go longer, you'll, you'll fight, you ju you'll just continue the fight. And so I would just encourage you guys to as everyone else said, use your voices, use your platform, ed continue to educate yourself, um, just not in the classroom, but on all the issues that are in our, our society today. And then be as selfless as possible uh, when, in, when pursuing your own dreams and, and, and pursuing the things that you want in life, because I do believe that they go hand in hand. Uh, I do believe you can be as successful as an individual but I think your biggest impact is going to come from when you think about the people around you and you think about the difference you can make in your community. I think that's when you're going to really soar and really excel. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> advice. You're welcome. Um, that was great advice. I'm taking that advice too. <laughs> uh, before we wrap up, is there any last note you want to share with um? everyone that's watching. I will plug the, so as there is the black players for change, 
Um, the NWSL Black Women also have a group called the Black Women's Player Collective, which is on Twitter and Instagram. So if you search them, look them up and follow us because we have a lot of stuff coming as well. Yeah, I'll just say thank you guys for having me. Uh, as Amani said, you guys are a group of, of bright young adults. I'm really happy to hear what you guys are doing in South Bronx. I follow you guys now through Andrew, through yourselves, and I'll make sure that you're continuing to do the good work that you're doing, continuing on this great path. So thank you guys for having me. Thank you guys for having me as well. Um, continue the awesome work that you're doing and keep this dialogue going. Um, I'm always available if you guys need me. If, you know, it's, it's, it's 2020. So uh, if you guys ever need me for anything, I'm, I'm available and I want to keep you guys, um, want to help you guys in any way that I can. But I also want to say I'm super proud of you guys too for putting this together and being in this space at this point of your life. We're all in this together. So um, I applaud you guys and proud of you guys and keep it going. Yes, thank you guys for having me on. This has been a great conversation. You guys are asking great questions. Well, I want to thank all three of you guys so much for being here. I think I can speak for all three of us that we have learned a lot. When I say a lot, it's a lot from you guys today. We also want to be taking this back to South Bronx student athlete activism club to inspire the group as we work towards our next project and become activists ourselves. So everyone watching, thank you so much for tuning in and you can watch the rest of tonight's panel in full right after the show ends. Just head back to the event in the website benefits.starbrosunited.org. Thank you so much to Imani, Ben Baker, and Justin so much for being here. I hope you guys will keep talking be an advocate for us young people and I hope you guys stay safe as well. Thank you so much and bye.